Hello, namaste, everyone, and welcome to our first NICLI virtual event of the year, One Day in the Life in India. Thank you all so much for joining us. We're very excited to be hearing from students on the National Security Language Initiative for Youth program in Indore, India, and an alumna, and to be connecting them with all of you today. During our event today, our NICLI student and alumni speakers will present about various topics in relation to the theme of one day in the life in India, including what it's like to live with an Indian host family, learn Hindi abroad in India, take part in extracurricular activities, and both partake in Indian cuisine as well as prepare some special dishes and other items. These topics were chosen to give students, educators, and others in the U.S. and the world an inside view into the unique experiences of NISLI students in India through their multimedia, which will include both their photos and videos, and to also share their valuable insights into the language and culture. Thank you, Nicole. This is Will Stewart, uh, Program Coordinator at Iron USA for the NISLI program. I am Nicole's colleague and very excited, as she said, to uh, be hosting this event. Um, we'd like to give you a little bit of an overview of what the event will look like. Uh, we'll start off with uh, the NISTLE students and alumni will each take turns presenting on their topics, which will cover a variety of things like their host families, food, culture, and everyday life in India. During the presentations, the chat box on the bottom right corner of your screen will be open for any comments or questions that you may have. We encourage lots of dialogue, uh, including in Hindi, if you'd like. We'll be monitoring the questions, so if students aren't able to answer them during their presentations, they can answer them during the Q&A. If you have a question that doesn't get answered, don't worry, hold it until the end but feel free to use it as an interactive way to interact with the students and the alumni during the presentation as well. The Q&A will be at the end and uh, the time will be devoted to your questions for students and alumni. Looking forward to a great event. Okay, thank you, Will. Um, but first, we'd like to see where all of you are joining us from. Uh, this is a map uh, that includes all the NISLI countries in different colors, um, as well as the U.S. there. And uh, you'll see Indian blue. Uh, so please join where, uh, please share where you're joining us from by typing it in the chat box on the bottom right corner of the screen. Um, we'd love to see where everyone's coming from today. Okay, wow, we see a lot of different states there in the U.S., um, as well as other countries. Senegal, okay. And of course, our students are joining from Indoor India um, and our alumna from Oregon. So we have quite a range of places here uh, in our virtual event today. And we'd also like to ask you to share what your affiliation is uh, with the NISLI program. We'd love to see exactly who's joining us today. So if you can click on um, any of these choices that pertain to you, uh, that would be wonderful. And we'll share with everyone in just a minute. Okay, looks like we have a lot of high school students uh, in the U.S. joining, which is very exciting. Glad to have you with us, as well as, um, you know, many different others, including Missley students, alumni, uh, educators, and uh, family members and friends, and program partners. So thank you, everyone, for joining us. And now, without much further ado, I'd like to introduce the NISLI students and alumna who are presenting today. Our four NISLI students are Kate, Sam, Liam, and Lauren, who are joining us from Indoor India. And our NISLI alumna is Haley, who's joining us from Oregon. So uh, please, everyone, uh, say hello to them in the chat box. <laughs> um, and you'll be hearing from each of them uh, in just a moment. Um, we'll be starting with Kate, um, who will be our first NISLI student speaker and she will be presenting on host family life in India. So Kate, um, go ahead uh, whenever you're ready. Thank you so much. All right, hi everybody. Uh, my name's Kate. I am from San Antonio, Texas, and I saw there was at least one person in the chat box from Texas, so hi to my fellow Texans. <laughs> um, 
Um, so here on my first slide, we have a picture of my host family. Um, so going from left to right, we have myself, obviously looking like I fit in very well. Um, my 16-year-old host sister named Muskan, who's in 11th grade in India. My host mom, my host dad, and my oldest host sister, um, Ranjana. So all four of us, um, we are in Indore, India for technically 10 months. Um, for the first semester, uh, we are with a host family, um, living in their homes with the exception of Liam. I'll talk about him in a second. Um, and then the second semester, starting in January, we are staying in dorms or hostels on campus um, to get a different experience and we'll go home to our host families on the weekend. So. First thing I want to say is that no host family is alike. Um, I come from a pretty modern Hindu family. Um, Liam actually has two host families. Um, both are teachers on Daly College campus, and he actually doesn't technically live with them. He lives on the dorms all year, uh, but he goes and visits his host both of his host families throughout the week. So his situation is a little different, um, and Sam and Lauren are also with um, two different uh, religious affiliated families as well. Um, that contribute to our diverse mix of host students and host families. Um, so something that Lauren will also touch on a little bit later is um, English in India and language learning, but um, I felt it was important to talk about English because coming to India I was really unsure how well I would be able to communicate not only with my host family but with my Hindi teachers and um, just people I would meet in everyday life, but I found that everyone I've ever really interacted with speaks English, at least to, an, to a level that we are able to communicate effectively. Um, everyone in my host family speaks English. Um, my dad may be the least of so, but we're still able to communicate, get what needs to be said done. Um, and Hindi is actually a really interesting language in that um, a lot of language has, uh, a lot of English language has been incorporated into Hindi because there may be certain words that are just People here may describe them as too heavy um, to be used in everyday um, dialogue. So an example is kya problem hai? So problem obviously being the English word. Um, and kya problem hai meaning basically like what's your problem? So it's very, very common to, in a Hindi conversation to hear various English words scattered in, which is actually really helpful when you're learning a language because if you're totally lost, uh, in the Hindi, you can pick up the one or two English words and at least keep up with what the subject um, at hand is, which is really nice. Um, so all four of us, again, with very different families, um, have kind of had a similar experience with um, English and Hindi and practicing what we learn at school at home with that um, all of our host siblings are attending an English medium school, so the daily college where we are students um, all the Indian classes are taught in English. So all of our um, host siblings are trying their best to improve their English skills, and so they want to speak with us in English, and we want to speak with them in Hindi. So it's a really fun process of trying to use both the languages and be fair and make sure everyone's getting their time to learn and do what they need to do. So we've had a fun time in reminding our family, saying, uh, Hindi me, Hindi me, in Hindi, in Hindi, you know? Tell me in Hindi. So um, one thing I was really surprised about when I first arrived is hopefully you can see in the pictures, my family is fairly modern. Um, they are very westernized. My two host sisters wear a lot of um, traditional uh, western dress. They don't enjoy traditional Indian wear such as saris or kurtis, uh, which you can be seen in the bottom picture, which my mom is wearing. Um, they like wearing clothes just like me. They take endless amounts of selfies. Um, they listen to Western music, um, which was really fun for me because I had some typical teenagers to hang out with uh, that I shared a lot in common with, but I also got to have a fun time kind of advocating for myself and saying, hey, I came to India to learn about everything, not just modern culture, but as well as the more traditional aspects that maybe you don't like, but I think are really cool. So I want to do the lame to stuff like wear a sari and get henna and do all the religious traditions and holidays and go out to temples. So it's been really fun and something I definitely didn't expect while coming. So food. Food is definitely a really important part of Indian culture. It's, um, it's a huge staple. I'm sure everyone's heard how good it is, uh, how spicy it is, which is true. Um, but 
coming from Texas, I ate a lot of Mexican food, so uh, spice wasn't too much for me, but I've still had my moments where it's been a little rough. Um, one thing that I've experienced is my host family sharing everything. We always share food. You never go out to a restaurant and order your own food. You all order as a collective group, and then you share. Um, and something that's been kind of difficult is um, force feeding. My mom loves me a lot, and one way that Indian host moms show their love is through giving you a lot of food, and the way you kind of receive that love is by eating it. So um, Indians tend to eat uh, larger portions than we do, and uh, a lot of heavier, rich, richer food, so that's been fun, and I've had to say, uh, Mama, must force koro, so please don't force me. Um, so it's been really interesting. Um, so unique differences between the United States and India in regards to food is that almost 99% of the meals you will eat in India are prepared by your host mom. Um, host mothers typically have um, help that comes in, so there's an abundance of labor in India, so it's very common to have servants or maids, um, whatever you would like, whatever your host family would like to call them. Uh, we don't have a 24-hour live-in maid. That's very common. We just don't. We just have someone who comes in and prepares ingredients for my host mom, and my host mom will finish the rest of the recipe by herself. Um, she also, during meals, will make rotis, which are pictured in the top um, right image. They're kind of like a tortilla, and she'll dish those out while we're eating. So she typically doesn't eat dinner with us, um, at least until the very end. So uh, uh, India is a very conservative society. Um, religion is a huge part. 80% um, of the population being Hindu, you'll see a lot of really bright, colorful things, um, a lot of gods and temples everywhere. My family's Hindu. Um, everyone's family is Hindu besides Sam's. His family is Sikh. Um, but one thing I've learned to do is just be very open-minded about everything. and. Because it's such an integral part of everyday culture, just you have to participate in religion and religious activities and uh, festivals if you want to see the real India. So I've really enjoyed getting to do that with my family. Obviously, we have two pictures of John, John Mashmi. Um, so I'll go ahead. I'm running short on time. So I'll go ahead and hand it over to Liam. But we have, y'all can see just really quickly, we have my um, schedule every day. So y'all can look at that, but Liam's going to continue and talk about school life. Here we are. All right. Good morning, everyone. Or in Hindi, Suprabhat. I'm Liam Pulsifer. I'm 18 years old, and I'm from Asheville, North Carolina. I'm here to talk to you about life on the Daily College campus. And this is what you're looking at is the Daily College main building, which was built in the 1880s as the school was being started by the British. Um, it's a beautiful building. And I'll start by going through the daily schedule. And as Kate mentioned earlier, my schedule is a little bit different from everyone else's because I live in a dorm. Um, my, my two host families are dorm host parents, or house parents. So they're in charge of running the boarding house. Um, and I live in a guest room, and I visit both of them, uh, both of those families, really regularly. So the daily schedule, the Danik Karyakram. Uh, the day starts really, really early with morning sports at 6 a.m. And those run for about 45 minutes to an hour. And then everyone gets cleaned up, studies a little bit, and heads to breakfast or nashta at 8. Breakfast lasts about 20 minutes. And then there's a dorm lineup where all the boys line up and the house parents just check to see if everyone's there, what's going on, um, that sort of thing. Afterwards, on some days, there's an assembly with announcements and presentations and such like. And then some days, people head to their classrooms to get ready for the day. Classes start at 9, and we exchange students have uh, two hours of Hindi classes from 9 to 11. But the regular Indian students, they uh, have just their normal classes the first three blocks of the day. And at 11, there is a tea break, which might be different for most of you in the United States. Um, there are two tea breaks in each day. After tea, everyone goes back to class, uh, and we do too. We, we have been going to psychology. I've been doing some computer science. Um, so we all head to class and then, and then to lunch at 1. After lunch at 2 o'clock are hobby classes, which Sam will elaborate on a little bit later. And then there's the afternoon sports period, so two sports periods per day. And after the sports are over, there's the second tea break of the day. Uh, so they kind of spread several meals out over the day, because each tea has a, has a substantial snack with it. 
Um, and then there's free time from 4.30 to 6 until everyone gets ready for study hall. Um, study hall is from 6.30 to 8, and then dinner happens, uh, which also might be a little bit kind of a, a different schedule for people who have primarily lived in America. It's a late dinner. Um, that lasts about 20 minutes. Then there's another dorm lineup, uh, and then everyone prepares for bed and uh, studies and does all of their you know, necessary things and hangs out and then heads to bed. All right, so let's move on um, to in the, in the uh, Indian classroom. I'm not really talking about the class, classes in, the, in Hindi that we take. Lauren will talk about those later. Um, but the, just a normal Indian classroom environment, what's that, what that's like. So the main thing that is different in an Indian classroom is the attitude about teachers, um, or adhyapak, as they're called in Hindi. Um, and teachers are incredibly important people in, in, in Indian society. Uh, there's a national holiday that's dedicated to teachers, um, and their word is kind of like law. You might, you could call them, you could say that there's a very parental relationship, or even that they're kind of considered as gods by their students who are handing down this gift of knowledge um, to the, you know, the, the young children. So with that in mind, classroom conduct is quite strict, quite um, kind of uh, upright, straight, uh, lots of note taking. Um, not to say that they don't get up to mischief. They are sometimes very naughty, as Indians love to say, um, which I find hysterical. Uh, and, but mostly, people are, are, are quite well behaved. Um, and classes are lecture based. There's rarely that does the teacher do anything other than simply stand in front of the class, talk, write on a blackboard. Um, and they're all blackboards. There are no, no real whiteboards, which is kind of interesting. Um, and uh, there's lots of memorization, rote learning, note taking, all of that sort of stuff. It's kind of like memorizing the book, which is very different from many United States classes. Uh, and two things I'd like to touch on that slightly contradict what Kate has said earlier. First, that um, even though everyone speaks English in, Hindi, in India, uh, or many people speak English, especially in uh, kind of middle to upper class families, there's a definite language barrier. Like Indian English is not at all like American English or, or even like British English. Like there are a lot of British terms, but then there are terms that are exclusively Indian. Uh, like one thing that people love to say is my arm is painting which is completely correct and you know perfectly fine but it sounds so strange when someone comes up to you and says my leg is painting and uh, maybe that's just me but it, it's, it's funny um, and there are all sorts of little kind of Indianisms like that all right and let's move on to oh sorry I missed the second part of what I was gonna say um, you may have you may have heard I had a, a strong conception of um, how hard Indian classes were going to be when I was uh, when I came here. Um, and I found that they're not really that difficult in terms of subject matter. Uh, the thing that is different is just the sheer amount of, the sheer number of things that people memorize. Uh, so that's kind of a difference, uh, that the subject matter can even be far less difficult than in American classes. But it becomes difficult when you factor in the uh, memorization involved. And now, on to um, in the boarding house and on campus. Boarding house may or campus car. So you see kind of that, that English, like there's not really a word for campus in Hindi um, that's regularly used. It's similarly strict in the boarding house. Um, I would compare it not unfavorably, but uh, it's a valid comparison with the kind of a military school environment in the United States. We don't have to do any push-ups if we do anything wrong, but um, it's strict, it's very scheduled. Um, the notoriously fluid Indian sense of time does not apply in the boarding house or on a school campus. It's very strictly regimented in that way. Um, people do study a lot, uh, and so that contributes to the sense of strictness. But as a trade-off, you get just an intense sense of camaraderie and familial relationship between boarding students and boarding students and house parents to the students. Um, they speak to the boys just like they would their own children. They yell at the boys like they would their own children. Um, so it's a really, it's a really kind of close, tight knit community, and it's really fun to be a part of. Uh, and now, with that said, I'm going to move on to our next presenter, Lauren, who is going to talk about the Hindi learning part of our.
experience. Okay, hello everyone. My name is Lauren Greger and I am from Lee Deadwood, South Dakota. There are probably no South Dakotans out there. Okay, I'm going to be talking to you today about language learning, which is one of the main parts of this program here. Okay. So we come to class for about two hours every day, as I believe Liam said. Which our classes are split between three different teachers, Dr. Rajapadhyay, Ma'am Benerjee, and Ma'am Pooja. Each of our teachers have fairly drastically different teaching styles, which keeps everything interesting. And we cover a lot of matter every day. And each teacher is kind of in charge of teaching something different. We've got some conversational Hindi, some grammar, some subject specific. So right off when we came to India, we didn't know very much Hindi at all. I saw there was a question down there on that. We had taken a bit of pre-departure language program, but no matter how much you think you know before you came, it doesn't get you very far. So in class, we jumped right into learning how to communicate. Like, hi, how are you? My name is, I am from. And then a while after that, we got more into the specifics. We started learning the alphabet. I think I've got a picture on the next slide that I can show you of that. The alphabet in Hindi is very scientific compared to what we have in our Roman script. Each letter stands for a specific sound and only that sound. So every sound in the Indian language, Hindi language, is assigned a letter. And you write that way, so it's, you're writing exactly as you speak. But unfortunately, there are a lot of little nuances in these sounds, making for some very difficult learning. There are a lot of letters that, to me, still sound exactly the same. I've been struggling a lot with a couple of them. For example, there are four different Indian letters for what we would write as a letter T, and four for what we'd, we would write as a letter D. But once you can master those, you can pronounce Hindi fairly easily. We've only recently started getting very deep into grammar. Indian grammar isn't the most difficult, but it's definitely different than what you would have studied in any other Latin-based language. For example, if you were to say, um, do you speak English? Aap angrezi so much te hain. You were really saying, you English understand are. So, getting used to that as well. Here I've got a picture of one of our more recent homework assignments written in the Hindi script. And a picture of, is that your art, Liam? Sam's art. We incorporate a lot of art into our curriculum. We go about once a week and do some culturally based art project. And we learn a lot of words that go along with it, words and phrases. And the Hindi language learning definitely continues after we go home from school. It said most high class Indians do speak English, but we're really encouraged to speak as much Hindi at home as we can. Our workers almost never speak very much English at all. And I personally spend a good part of my day with my servants, so I get a lot of speaking practice and understanding from that. And I'd like to say we don't study quite as much as our Indian host siblings, but there's definitely quite a bit to keep up with at home. And I just like to say that I really love learning Hindi. It's, it's great, it's interesting, it's a challenge, but that's what we're here for. I think that's everything I wanted to cover. I will move it on here now to Sam. Hello guys, my name is Sam Riker, and I'm going to be talking a little bit about hobbies and extracurriculars. So, as you can probably already guess, we spend a lot of our time here in indoor at the Daily College. We spend all our, all our time during the day here, during classes, 
and uh, one of us even lives here full time. So it makes sense that our hobby classes and extracurriculars would also take place at the Daily College. Right here, um, there is a picture of us in the art room. This was after one of the uh, many holiday-inspired uh, art projects that we did after Indian Independence Day. So basically every festival or holiday that comes up within the Indian calendar, we will make some sort of art project on it, and that's a great way to uh, really learn about a different part of Indian culture, which I will continue to talk about later on. So Hindi, the Hindi program extracurriculars can basically be divided up in two parts, hobbies and sports. Uh, hobby classes take place in the CTDC, which is the building pictured on the slide. And as for sports, there are tons of facilities on campus, um, basically anything you could think of or ask for if you're into sports. And it's really a great place to you know, participate in some music, some art, some physical activity. Okay. So my personal extracurricular schedule starts out with the music room, or I mean, I, I'm playing tabla, which is a kind of Indian drum, Indian hand drum. And one important thing before I go any further to acknowledge about Indian extracurriculars is they're not really, oh, oh. and speaking of tabla, here is uh, Miss Liwai Alma Haley Kaskela with some tabla. I don't remember which drum that's specifically called, but there is the other one. Very good. I'm sure she's so much better than me. It's crazy. Um, so extracurriculars with this with Indian schools in general aren't really considered extracurricular. Rather, they're just as much a part of a curriculum as math, English, science, or Hindi. Um, so just art and sports are taken very seriously here. Kids really pride themselves on athletic or musical ability as much as they do, you know, if they get good marks on an exam. So our hobbies can basically be split up into nritya or dance, sangeet or music, or kala, which means art. Uh, with regards to dance, I personally have not taken any dance classes while in the daily college, but from what I've heard and what I understand, it's a uh, very, uh, a wide program. There's Bollywood, classical Indian dances, and Western. <laughs> That's Liam's thumb. Liam's thumb, along with the rest of Liam, is taking dance classes. Uh, I'm sure he's having a great time with it. Um, Sangeet, this is uh, definitely what I know the most about with regards to art. Um, the really cool thing about going taking Indian music lessons is there are instruments that you will never have the opportunity to play in almost anywhere in the West. So I'm taking tabla classes. You can take sitar and harmonium. Sitar is a string instrument. We don't really have an equivalent, but it's somewhat close to a guitar, and the harmonium is like a crazy piano accordion hybrid, which is uh, lots of fun. And as for art, um, continuing theme of impressive amounts of diversity, there is bamboo craft, needlework, painting, drawing, sculpture, and really anything that an artist could want to do. On the sports, um, again, <laughs> really wide range of stuff. Football, squash, basketball, tennis are very popular choices. Uh, you can swim, you can roller skate, uh, you can do basically anything. And what I find about daily college sports is that uh, coaches are really, really accommodating. So I'm playing tennis, which I kind of fundamentally know how to do. Um, but some of us are playing squash, which is a game that none of us had experienced. And coaches are awesome about letting us you know, try and learn a sport that we had never encountered before. And here are some more pictures of sports facilities. You've got a football field and, well, football, soccer, you know and uh, squash court. So why are extracurriculars important? So when talking about you know Hindi classes, and especially classes with our Indian peers at Daily College, uh, strictness gets brought up a lot. Lots of studying, lots of respect to the teachers, and things like that. And with my experience of art classes, music classes, things are a bit different. Um, kids still have an incredible amount of respect for their teachers. 
and really value the information that they're giving, whether it be sculpture or sitar. But it's definitely a different kind of atmosphere. Rather than lecturing, of course, the classes are much more hands-on, and they are really a good opportunity to see another side of the Indian educational uh, methods. Um, my tabla classes, for example, I um, I speak to my tabla teacher and you know converse with them much like I would a teacher in the U.S. And well, teachers here are really nice, really great people. It's just a kind you have a kind of formality with them that you don't usually have with uh, many United States teachers. So a lot of our uh, our cultural learning, I think, has really come from extracurriculars. Um, Indian art and music has a lot of they have a lot of history behind them, and they really uh, add another perspective to learning about Indian culture. So I think they've been a really vital uh, part of our experience, and I'm really happy we can take part of them. And now we're going to move on to Liam, Kate, and Haley, I believe, to talk about Indian food. Um, all right, and as I mentioned earlier, I live on campus, so I'm going to talk to you a bit about uh, cafeteria food and the food in my host family, because uh, those are the, the two foods that I eat most regularly. Cafeteria food here at the Daily College is quite tasty. Yeah, it's very good. It's, it's better than all, pretty much every cafeteria food I've had in America. Um, there is a lot of poha, which is this middle food that you can see, which is a, an indoor specialty. Um, it's a kind of flat rice, but it's a little sweeter than rice you might have tasted. Um, and it's, it's delicious, yeah. But, uh, and they also serve um, a lot of dal, which is a, a lentil kind of stew soup thing. It's, it's difficult to explain. Um, and uh, they serve a lot of vegetarian food. In fact, everybody in India, like veg and non-veg are, are such commonly used words. Like you'll, you'll go up to somebody, you'll be eating dinner with them or something, and they'll say, are you veg or non-veg? Uh, which I find very confusing because in the United States, vegetarians are such a uh, minority, but here in India, they're a clear majority. So that's something you have to get used to. Luckily, if you're a vegetarian, you will find things wonderful here. Um, there will, you have no problems whatsoever. The food that you're looking at right now, um, on the left is pakora, in the middle is mung ki dal, and on the right is uh, lauki, curry, or roti. Uh, and or means and in Hindi, so that's an odd thing to get used to, just for the record. Um, and these are all foods from my host family. Uh, my host family is Rajasthani, and that means they're from the state of Rajasthan, which is an Indian state just north of us. And their food is renowned for being spicy. So I have just, just now gotten to the point where I can eat the food that my host family eats without, any, uh, without my host mom having to tone it down. Um, in fact, I just ate my first full plate of the same food that they eat, and I only had to drink three and a half glasses of water. So I was pretty proud of myself. Um, but with that said, all of the different regions of, of India have very different food traditions. Uh, Rajasthani food, as I said, is really spicy. Uh, South Indian food doesn't have an easy way to describe it, but it's completely different than all other foods. Punjabi food is very rich and heavy on oils and butters. Um, and Gujarati food is notoriously sweet. So there's lots of, there, there's so much culinary diversity that if you're a food person, you will just, you'll, you'll love spending time in India. Uh, it's really noticeable for, uh, for food. Um, and now I'm going to pass it on to Haley, who will talk a little bit more about her food experience when she was here last year. So. All right, hi there. Namaste. Mera naam Haley hai. Um, I'm an alumna from the 2014-2015 Hindi program, which also took place in indoor India. Um, so, as an alumna, I get a lot of questions about India. And actually, one of the most common questions I get is, how was the chai? So, I can assure you, it does not disappoint. Um, culturally speaking, um, if you're a guest at someone's house, um, it's typical for them to offer you chai. It's a gesture of common courtesy. Um, and as you may have guessed, Indian chai is quite different from what you'd get in a typical American coffee shop. So I thought I'd show you how it's done the Hindustani way. So I have a video and Nicole's going to start that. 
In Hindi, the word chai literally means tea, so saying chai tea is a little bit redundant. Um, the ingredients you'll need for chai, water, pani, milk, food, tea, chai, ginger, adarak, sugar, chini, also sometimes called sugar, and cardamom, a lychee. Some utensils you need, bratan, a pot, a grater, kaduka, a spoon, chamak, and a tea strainer, chai tomi, as well as the knife, chaku. So add 8 cup pani, there's a little bit of an example of English, um, and 8 cup dud to the pot. Um, and one interesting note about the milk is that it's usually buffalo milk, which took me a while to figure out. Um, so go ahead and grate the ginger. You want a half inch to an inch depending on how much ginger you like in your tea. I personally love it, so I put quite a bit in. And then you're going to add the chai leaf. And this is the particular brand that my host family uses. So you want three spoons. In Hindi, ek one, do two. And then add the sugar, which is chini, and two spoons of that. Alright, and then add just a little bit of cardamom. And cardamom is usually added to the chai during winter, um, but it's one of my favorite spices, so I usually add it anytime. Alright, go ahead and put the stove, uh, turn the stove on high, and then add all the ingredients to the pot. And wait for it to start to boil. Um, and Indian stoves are generally gas stoves. So in just a minute, you'll see the milk will start to puff up. And what you'll do if you have a gas stove is just turn the, the flame up and down. Um, I don't, so I'm going to lift the pot up and down to, so the milk will rise and fall. And you want to do that about 8 to 10 times. All right. And that will give you a good strength of the brew of the tea. And then just go ahead and strain it into your mug. I got my nice uh, Nukadwali chai mug in a, a mug from the Daily Caller, which is the bowl that we were all at. And you're all done. And chai is often eaten with uh, biscuits and the tea. Uh, meal structure is similar in that there are three meals a day, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So breakfast is known as nashta, and an interesting thing to note is that nashta is a word that can also be used um, for snack, so they'll say that for tea time also is called nashta. Um, one thing you might have for breakfast, this is pratha, it's a flatbread. Um, the flatbread, uh, it's generally a stuffed flatbread, so here these are cauliflower pratha. And then poha, uh, we've talked about poha, but um, it's a very famous dish in indoor, and you'll see it um, in roadside stands a lot. So it, again, it's a flat rice that's, um, the main spice in it is turmeric, so that's what the yellow um, is from. And then lunch, or dopurka kana, or dopurka bojan. Um, and we've talked a little bit about the English, so it, it is perfectly acceptable to say lunch. Um, dopurka bojan is what we call shuddha hindi, or pure deep hindi. Um, and this is a very typical lunch meal. So you have your sabzi, which is the vegetable, the dal, the lentil stew, and the roti, the flatbread. And then dinner, which is called ratka bojan or ratka kana, which literally means uh, evening meal or evening food. This is my absolute favorite Indian dish. It's chole. It's a, um, a chickpea curry. Um, but as we've uh, touched on, Indian food is very diverse. So you could have, there are so many different options that you could have. Uh, and chole is eaten with this great um, fried flatbread uh, called batura. All right, so masala means spices, and you really can't talk about Indian food without talking about spices because it's so important to the flavor of a dish. Uh, so here in this picture, I have a masala daba, which means a spice box, and it holds all your commonly used spices. Um, so you can just add them really quick to the dish. Um, and one interesting thing to note is that my host family, um, actually, they dry their own peppers and they grind their own spices. Um, so the spices are really fresh. And freshness is a theme with Indian food. So as opposed to going to a supermarket, most Indians will go to a sabzi mandi or a vegetable market, which are these stands set up usually on the side of the road um, and purchase their vegetables and fruits there. And on Monday in Indo, actually, there is what we 
probably consider a farmer's market. Um, so many, many farmers uh, will come and share their produce uh, and stand alongside the main roads. There's also lots of examples of food being grown locally. So here is a potato field. You can see here, potato in Hindi is aloo. And here is also a chickpea field, and in Hindi that's chole. So I thought, what better way to get a taste of India than to actually get a taste of it? So here are two recipes. Um, on the left, you have poha, uh, the flat rice dish. And this is a recipe that is from um, our resident director. So she taught uh, the students last year how to make this. And on the right, there's burji, which um, burji you can make lots of different ways. But this uh, particular recipe, I've compared it to like uh, an Indian scrambled egg. So if you want to screenshot uh, this uh, slide, and also I believe this PowerPoint will be available, and Nicole has shared the link in the chat box. Um, you can try those out on your own. And Nicole, I'm going to hand it back to you now for questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Haley, uh, and everyone. Um, we really enjoyed, you know, watching your looking at your multimedia, and and I know everyone has certainly learned a lot from you all about Indian culture and the Hindi language and the cuisine and all of those amazing things. So thank you so much for sharing about your lives in India with all of us. Um, I'd like to actually. Um, ask you all uh, students and alumni uh, speakers who have just presented to all turn on your webcams uh, for our Q&A session uh, so we can see all of your lovely faces um, and you can all um, you know respond to the questions that, that people ask um, but I'd like to maybe start off with one uh, general question and then we can throw it out to the audience so um, as you turn on your webcams um, presenters um, I'll ask you, um, how have your daily interactions with people there in India, or how did they when you were there, Haley? Um, you know, from your host families to your Indian peers to shopkeepers, everyone you've been interacting with, how did that, how has that changed, or how did it change as you built on your Hindi language skills throughout your time in India? And if you'd like to start, Haley, since you're up there on the screen, um, yeah. that would be awesome. Thank you. Um, so one of the things for me um, with Hindi learning, um, it really strengthened relationships for me. So um, people really respected that you were taking the time to learn their language and learn the culture. Um, so for me, we did have a live-in maid, and so her name was Rita Didi, and so uh, she only spoke Hindi. Um, so I got to know her a lot better once I could communicate effectively in Hindi. Thank you so much, Haley. Yeah, that, that's definitely really um, great to hear that your relationships did, you know, strengthen uh, as you learned the language. And anyone else would you like to share? Um, I see you up there, Lauren and Sam. Anyone can feel free to jump in, either uh, Liam, Kate, Lauren, or Sam, to just let us know how your daily interactions have changed um, while you've been there and built on your Hindi language skills. So how our daily interactions have changed? Um, I mean, I think they've just kind of multiplied as our Hindi has gotten better and better. You just, people become much more available and you go from being able to converse to, converse with, you know, your host family and your teachers and fellow exchanges to host family and teachers and fellow exchanges and household helpers and uh, drivers and just people you see on the street and um, it's great. It's really nice that uh, as you go along with the program you can really chart your progress by who you can speak to. I, know, I think it's really it's a fun way to do it. So Lauren, you got anything? Well, I mentioned that I spend a lot of time with my servants. It's been really neat going from where I could barely talk to them to we were sitting in the kitchen today just conversing. And very slowly, but it was happening. <laughs> you. Um, and so we'd like to invite everyone, you know, to continue uh, typing in questions in the chat box and, and for our students and alumni here. Um, I see there are quite a few in there. Um, so I'll, I'll look through those and see um, maybe what we can answer um, moving on here. Um, are other students generally the same age, Lydia is asking? Um, would anyone like to, to answer that? 
maybe uh, in terms of your extracurricular activities, since you do those with your Indian peers as well. Um, I answered this in the chat box, but I'll just go ahead and repeat it. Typically, students that we interact with are younger than us. Um, in India, the way the schooling system is set up, um, they graduate at age 17. So uh, uh, I think, so Lauren and I, our host sisters, are both uh, 16, and we are both 18. Liam's siblings are both considerably younger. 13 and 11. Yeah, and Sam is the only one who has a host brother that's actually our own age. Um, but but all your ex all your extracurriculars, you'll be with a wide a wide variety of ages. So typically, everyone is younger than you because everyone at DC graduates at 17, and we're all 18. So everyone's going to be younger, but it's really fun. Everyone likes to talk to you, especially the little kids. Okay, thank you, Kate. And I see here that Gemma uh, was asking, can you walk everywhere you go throughout the day, and how do you get to or from school? So we uh, within school we. Walk everywhere. The campus is really walkable. Um, there, so you will. Um, it's a little easy to get lost in, honestly. I, uh, I definitely had my share of running around aimlessly for the first, you know, couple weeks. But uh, yeah, campus is fine. With regards to getting there, um, I personally take a, a neighbor drives me and my host brother to school every day and then I take the school bus home and if you're on a program uh, within a couple weeks you can the school bus and who knows. Maybe Thank you Sam and I see Will uh, you have a question here would you like to, to ask it with your mic? Sure uh, namaste mera naam will hey and uh, like I said I'm Nicole's colleague I just wanted to hear about any sort of culture shock that you guys might have experienced while being there. And Haley, you can jump in too if you remember anything from your experience. And I know I know the answer to the question is probably yes, but it might be different for different people. So maybe if a couple of you guys could talk about some of the challenges that you've experienced and how you've overcome them since arriving. And then Haley, maybe something you experienced uh, while you were there. I can go ahead and start on this one. Um, for me, actually, I think the biggest culture shock was communication style. Um, so just the way things are, instructions are given to you are sometimes more vague than what, than what we're used to. And um, I guess uh, sometimes some things aren't spoken directly um, in ways that are confusing. And some things are spoken very directly in ways that are kind of shocking. Um, so that was one thing I really had to adjust to. I think there is a bit of a lag uh, due to the connection uh, with our students in India, so they may just take a moment before they uh, go ahead and respond. But whenever they're ready, they can go ahead. All right. Well, I will start um, start by saying that India is a, is a good place in terms of the people are all so friendly that culture shock in terms of like really harsh kind of painful culture shock doesn't really exist. It doesn't really happen often. Um, but the little things are what start to get you eventually as you're adjusting to a different culture. Um, things like, why is it prohibited to drink water between bites of food? Like, what's going on? Why does that make sense? Um, and there are so many little things like that where I'm sure if I hadn't been raised in America and I came to America, I'd be I'd say, you know, why do we do this? Why do we do that? But in India, every day, I'm just, I, I think, what is going on here? Like, why is this happening? About something or other. Um, exactly. And Haley's, Haley's hitting the nail on the head when she says it's kind of like cultural fatigue. After a while, you're just like, all of these, all these little things that are just a tiny bit weird or a tiny bit annoying start to pile up. And you're like, okay, I just need to sit in my room and watch American TV shows for about six hours. Uh, I'm, I'm seeing another question that I would really like to answer too. Um, sorry if I'm hogging the mic, but uh, parts of the culture that that I've really embraced and started doing without thinking about. Oh yes, um, for one, the Indian head bo head bobble, head bobble, just back and forth, you know, mm -hmm. it is so easy to get into a rhythm of doing the head bobble, um, and also nodding like this. 
this means like, yeah, like sure, that's fine. Um, and since there's not really a, a regularly used word for sure in Hindi, because I say sure all the time, I just use the, the little like figure eight head nod. Um, and so that's, that's really easy. And there are a lot of little things like that, like eating with your hands, eating with the roti as a kind of spoon, fork, utensil um, to bring food to your mouth is really easy to get used to as well. Um, yeah, oh man, there's, there's a lot of just tiny little Okay, thank you so much, Liam. Um, maybe we can just end on um, you know, sharing a little bit about what you guys might have in store for the future, if you have ideas about what you may want to do after um, Nifli, I know some of you will be going on to college, but you know, career-wise, um, how you may you know, want to use your Hindi language skills um, for this experience moving forward. <laughs> All right. All right, so yeah, I think we're all actually headed to college, or as we very quickly started, as we calling, it here very university. Quickly started calling it here um, university, after, uh, um, after the Nestle uh, Life program. I wanna use, uh, how I want to use um, Hindi, um, in the honestly, future. I'm not incredibly sure. I, um, I plan on going into international studies, um, either law or journalism. Um, and even if I don't end up using Hindi in that, I, uh, I think like any international long-term experience is really, really valuable. And just all the cultural knowledge that I'll have gained from living in a different country for a year, I think will definitely serve me in any kind of international career type thing. So, um, like I said previously, I had applied to college uh, the same time I was applying to NISLI, and I chose to reapply right now, so I'm actually doing college apps right now. Uh, but in 2016, I'll be going to college along with the rest of these guys. Um, similar to Sam, I hope to go into international relations, hopefully with the focus um, maybe on humanitarian studies, hoping to work in the Middle East um, using Hindi. Um, obviously, I, I'm definitely interested in um, places outside of the United States. So whether um, I end up working in India or in the Middle East or in uh, South America, I don't know. Um, but I think just after you've learned one language um, and you travel and you tell people that you're bilingual and that you are fluent in a language other than just English, it kind of opens, gives them um, like an open mind to accepting you more, showing them that you're not just some person who's coming to tell them what, like, here's what you're going to do, and I'm this grand person from America here speaking my language. It kind of shows them that you have put in the time and effort to experience something new and that you really are dedicated to what you're doing, especially in my line of work. So. All right, um, and I really am not sure what I would like to do after I go to college next year. Um, and so, yeah, I, I don't know what I'll end up doing. Uh, and I don't know if I'll end up using Hindi in my career either. Uh, but honestly, that doesn't bother me that much because this is kind of something that I'm doing for myself. I'm doing it in, in the hopes of learning more about myself, in the hopes of challenging myself and gaining a skill that, whether useful or not, will still be incredibly cool and interesting to have and to study and will uh, kind of give me a, a focus and um, so yeah, that's that's what I'm here for, and that's why and that's why I also am not sure exactly what's going to happen next. So we'll see. Yeah. Right. What's left? And I was. Typing. You're going to just say you're going to be a linguist. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm going to be a linguist and study Arabic in college. Um, I will come back to India and talk to Indians. I'm sorry, that's I don't have a professional use for it. Very good. Yeah, and for me, right. I would like to. Oh. Am I good? Okay. Uh, as far as college, I'd like to study Hindi. It's a bit hard to find a Hindi program in the U.S., um, but I'd like to study um, sustainable agriculture, also looking at international relations, like a few have mentioned. And I'm hoping to work actually in India uh, with a grassroots sort of NGO. And actually, I got interested in sustainable um, agriculture in India also when I visited a village called Senawadia and a woman named uh, Janik McGilligan who works there. Okay, awesome. Thank you guys so much for sharing all of your exciting uh, future plans. You know, I've 
even if you don't quite know yet, um, you know, definitely this experience will, you know, serve you very well, um, I'm sure. So, so thank you guys. Um, and I'll hand it over to Will quickly um, to share some NIFLI resources with all of you. So first of all, big thank you to our presenters and our alumna. Um, got a great, great overview of what daily life looks like as a participant in an NSLIY program. I'm sure everyone here is uh, really hungry for some curry and, and thirsty for some chai and, and excited for the possibility of participating in a program like this. We have some great resources. Uh, we have our uh, alumni who are helping us out right now, but we also have some online resources such as our NSLIY for Youth website where you can learn more about the program, including how to apply. Applications are open now, so we encourage you, if you are interested, to go and explore the website. Uh, there's also the NSLIY interactive website. And this website is specifically to showcase the language learning and cross-cultural experiences that NSLIY scholars have um, through their stories and their multimedia. We'll be posting a recording of this virtual event right now and uh, students' multimedia within the next week, so be sure to check that out. You can also find stories, photos, videos by and about students and alumni in all of the NISLI countries as well as uh, different authentic language learning resources as well. So make sure you go online, check out those sites. They have a lot of useful information, a lot of entertaining things too, um, and just a really good idea of what life looks like on program, and hopefully a taste of what uh, the language learning experience abroad looks like. Uh, Nicole? Okay, thank you so much, Will. And again, I wanted to echo Will uh, in thanking all of our amazing NISLI students and our amazing alumna there um, who've really shared a wealth of knowledge with all of us and, and definitely inspired all of us. Um, I know I definitely want to learn Hindi uh, very much now and, and all about the culture. Um, so we really appreciate all of your hard work and, and um, you know, your volunteering to share uh, with all of us uh, about your experiences. Um, and thank you all so much um, to the audience for joining us today. We, we really hope you've enjoyed hearing from and connecting with our students and alumna um, and, you know, learned more about the NISLI program as well as um, about India and the culture and, and the language. Um, so hopefully um, you'll join us again for future NISLI uh, interactive virtual events. Um, uh, as Will mentioned, on the NISLI interactive website, we'll also be, um, you know, posting uh, future events, so definitely check that out um, and join us again. Uh, so thank you so much, everyone, and um, again, uh, we really appreciate your joining us. Um, have a wonderful day or evening in India. <laughs> thank you again.